you come with some good questions for Mr. Lund. He has been in Detroit for all of his life, I believe, and uh, lived through much of the history of our city. He was there at the time of the 67 Rebellion, and he's been an active participant in activism. He's been an author, historian, politician, you name it, he's been there and he can answer. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my dear friend, Mr. Thank you, Karen. Uh, when I was young, elementary school age, I traveled all over the country. Uh, and I heard today that Milan schools were shut down because of a bomb threat. Um, we know, <coughs> excuse me, we all know what happened in Florida on Valentine's Day. But in March of 1956, my Hylia school district was closed due to a bomb threat, 1956. It's been around a long time. Um, I have, I, would, I lived in Ecorse during my high school years, which is a working class suburb uh, that borders Detroit's south side. And uh, Ecorse was a city that was composed of uh, two sections. Uh, everything, everyone south of Outer Drive was white or Latino. Everyone north of Outer Drive, any course, was African American. There was no border. There was no exceptions in, in the 1960s to that division. Uh, so, E course was a model of the so segregation of the southern states, even uh, during my young adulthood. Uh, <clears throat> the only place where integration took place was in the junior high and high school. And everybody considered it normal to be together. But the adults that habitated and built the city believed, you know, operated on a segregationist model. Um, that changed in E-Course. It changed a lot of things in Detroit in 1967 when there was a rebellion. Anybody got, is the 1967 rebellion something that you know anything about at all? Is it common? Is it known? Um, basically, there was an uprising. It was a shooting war. Federal troops were sent in. Police were being shot. Residents were being shot. Anybody know why? Go ahead. That, that was definitely the spark. Uh, there was an a after-hours uh, bar that was operating. The police did a raid on it. And uh, I think you know, there was a huge number of folks who were expelled in, onto the street. And somebody threw a brick, I think. There was something that precipitated it, and, and it just escalated. And then it spread throughout the city. Why did it spread? Um, I didn't know at the time. I was, I was in e-course and at the time there was a curfew and it extended down into our city. And I didn't take the curfew seriously and I got arrested. Fortunately, I was arrested with a friend whose father was uh, uh, a high official in the fire department and they knew, they knew their family so I got, out, got released uh, very shortly. But uh, it was a complete lockdown on the city. And the arrest was merely for being on the street. That's how, how serious it was. Um, I didn't know at the time what caused that. I had watched, and I, I, I was very mindful of the things that were being talked, I, I get, you weren't here, but uh, were being talked about in the earlier session, where, where if you were African American and you tried to go to a place to eat they didn't want you you would be attacked and you know uh, the police would bring dogs to attack you if you congregated um, but I never knew that was part of Detroit and so what I found when I eventually decided why in the heck did this ever happen in Detroit was that the police operated that way in Detroit but it was undercover there was something called the Big Four. And what this, starting in the 1920s, 
when Detroit ran Klan candidates for mayor, Ku Klux Klan candidates, opens white supremacists, and white supremacy and anti-Semitism were the thinking of the day in Detroit as well as the United States. Uh, Henry Ford was one of the big pushers of that in Detroit and beyond. Charles Lindbergh, the guy who, you know, the father of flight in the United States. And they were, they were pushing us. And a guy ran as a Ku Klux Klan candidate for mayor in, uh, in the 1920s. And he lost because he was a write-in candidate and they misspelled his name. <laughs> The, the Klan supporters couldn't spell his name, so that's the only reason he lost, but he became mayor in the 1930s. And what they did is they would go down south and they would recruit people in the police department that were physically big white males and bring them in, and they would op, op, be in plain clothes, in suits, and they would be in plain black cars, unmarked black cars, <clears throat> but they were distinctive, and they would ride through the, the black community in Detroit as well as in River Rouge and Ecorse, wherever black residents were, even if it was cross-border, and they would just bring terror in the community. What do I mean? <clears throat> Excuse me, what do I mean by terror? Now, the folks on the white side of Outer Drive in Ecorse didn't even know this was happening on the other side of Outer Drive in Ecorse. But patrols cars would come through, and if you were on the street, they would tell you, come here, in some derogatory term that they would address you. And um, what they would do to inspire terror is to grab people off the street and beat them and kill them. They would say, they would tell you, after they berated you, you run, you go, leave us right now. And if you ran with your back to them, away from the car, you were subject to being shot in the back as an escaping suspect. That's how the Big Four operated in Detroit. Now, they would go into the poorer white community also and beat people up, but they wouldn't do the killing and they wouldn't do it systematically and it would be in response to something the white person did. In the black community, it was provoked by the police. And I didn't know it when I was living in a community that had this present until <clears throat> I started working in the steel mill and talking to older men who told me the stories. And some wouldn't talk about it. So that was my encounter with people who were being uh, killed and harassed. My second encounter was something that was called a draft board. Anybody know, familiar with what the draft was for the U.S. Army? And, well, the Marines also used the draft, but 90% of the draftees were Army. Then the second challenge was that I was, as a high school graduate, I was facing being drafted to go to a war in Vietnam. And I didn't know why we were having a war in Vietnam. And uh, I started <clears throat> watching the news and paying attention to it because it had something to do with me and all my high school friends. And we used to have meetings and talk about what in the heck are we gonna do if this comes down on us? Because if when you were about 18 and a half to 19, that's when, you, that's when they started, started drafting you. And, uh, and we started paying attention to what was going on in the war and what it was about. And ostensibly it was about some naval incident in 1964, but it wasn't really about that at all. And we started watching what, what was going on. And we realized that the Vietnamese were considered substandard people and the United States have every right to invade their country and kill them. Any idea how many people we killed in Vietnam? Anybody? You know how we did it? Anybody? 
We killed a million people. So we made decisions that we were going to resist. Now, I did get drafted because there were other parts of the military that I thought were justifiable. At that time, I believed it. So I said, I'm going to participate in that, but I'm not going to participate in the war because I'm not going to go over and kill people. And so, um, by aerial bombardment, by dropping flammable jellied gasoline on villages that burned people to death, and a small amount by actual military conflict, most of the population we killed were unarmed. And we could, the, some, many Americans turned against the war after it was about five years old. But for a long time, people felt that Vietnamese people were not people like us, and their lives didn't matter. And so we could be like the Germans in World War II. We could kill people because we had a racist concept that they were substandard, that they weren't fully human. I was very conscious of World War II. I thought it was a great thing we did, and I still believe it today the greatest thing the United States ever did. Helped defeat the Axis powers. Um, but I had friends who were killed. This is harder than I thought. And it never leaves you. Have you ever heard of a movie called Hearts and Minds? Hearts and Minds, it's a documentary on Vietnam era. It's about what we did and why we did it and the mentality that took us there. In the 60s, those were the big questions around race and our role as a, a society, how we treated people within our country and how we treated people outside our country. Around the time you were born, there was, some, there was a, an invasion of Iraq. And all the news showed night after night at the point of the invasion was the bombing and the obliteration of Baghdad. And this was done in a celebratory way. We're getting rid of the evil dictator. They were wiping out a city. And the military and the George Bush was president. He's the one that ordered the second George Bush. He organized. They called it shock and awe. We're going to shock and awe them to submission. And so we just bombed them mercilessly. How can we do that? Would we do that to England if they didn't do what we said? Would we do that to Germany if they didn't do what we said? Why can we do it to them? And so these, these are the continuing challenges of how we relate to people in the world, in my, in my experience. And I was shocked and awed just that I was numbed that people could sit there after all these decades of all these tragedies and watch this and be okay with it. Um, I dedicated myself to not being one of the people who, out of ignorance, tolerates it, but always willing to make people uncomfortable if the truth is not told by telling the truth as I saw it. Um, and uh, 
the, the Vietnam War and the American Civil Rights Movements and the, the fight against the civil rights, uh, the, the fight for civil rights and the fight against the war were the things that shaped a generation of people in my age. I'm a, I'm a few months short of 70 years old. And, uh, and I have no regrets about any of the fights I've been in. Today, in, in Michigan, what it, it, it stuns me how we can pass a, a law that takes away the rights of people to vote or takes away the rights of people to have an elected government, put it that way. We pass a law and the governors only use it on black communities, whether they're on the west side of the state, whether they're Detroit, whether they're in Oakland County or in Saginaw County. That we could have a governor that a year ago proposed closing 38 schools in the state of Michigan out of four or 500 that were considered underperforming. And it just so happens that all 38 of them were African American majority schools. But there were hundreds of low performing white schools that were never mentioned. This is still a reality in your life right now. And this is still, this is going on while you were growing up. And so the state of Michigan took over our, our school district, which is a vital, it doesn't feel that when you're in, a, in school, it doesn't feel how vital it is for the community, but as you grow older and you see its role and see what would happen if you didn't have one, the school district is vital for the fu future of a community. And in 1999, when the, the Detroit Public Schools was, had a financial surplus, had rising test scores, was doing better than 50% of the schools in the state of Michigan, they took it over because they wanted to control the financial, the m money when the school district had one and a half billion dollar budget. And so the governor abolished the school board and took over and put somebody in charge. And they, they brought the mafia in to run operations. And, um, and they started dismantling our school district. And if you see the news reports on the Detroit Public Schools, uh, to, the, to this day, out of the last 19 years, the school, his only, school district has only had an elected school board with power for four years out of 19 years. Yet the newspapers will report as Detroit Public Schools has this failing or that failing or that failing. 38 kids in a classroom. There's just a story in the free press on that on Sunday. They didn't mention emergency managers did this. The state agents created these conditions. And then when the report, they report it as bad, they say, people say, who are outside of Detroit say, oh, somebody's got to do something about those school districts. No, it, it wasn't. My children were in Detroit public schools when they took it over. They were, it was, there were phenomenal schools across the city. And there were also schools that were struggling across the city. But now they've just about undermined every school in the city. They've weakened every school in the city. They've closed many of the schools of the city. They got rid of teachers so people would have overcrowded classrooms and then they would leave the city. This is going on on an entirely racialized basis. And everybody seems to be okay with that. And the, the, so this, you know, the, the, this fight wasn't over when the civil rights laws were passed because the civil rights laws are ignored. I was the lead plaintiff in a lawsuit challenging this as unconstitutional. The courts refused to hear it. I'm, I was president of the Detroit Library Commission. We filed a suit in Ingham County because the state was trying to take over our library, which is a separate municipal corporation. The judge heard the arguments and said, I'm not going to make a decision on this case. 
after we spent months and $30,000 to try and make our case. But the Attorney General said we can do whatever we want. The Attorney General <clears throat> said in terms of fighting us at the, in the federal court, all the, we went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. He said there is no constitutional right to an education in Michigan. It's a right of privilege. That's what's happening 20 miles from you right now. Um, and uh, now that attorney general wants to be the governor this fall. Uh, and a lot of people will vote for him thinking he has integrity. Um, what does a person with a just, justice in their heart with values of justice and fairness for all human beings, what is, how do you respond to an environment where you're living in the midst of all this? How do you respond? What, what do you do? That is the constant challenge. Um, I was privileged to be educated by a lot of people when I, both when I was in college and when I was in community. People who were willing to take, take the time to explain and educate me so that I could live my life in a way that was truthful. All of you know something about World War II, I'm sure. Any, any idea how many people were killed in World War II? Any ideas? 30 million Russians were killed, 20 million others. Fifty million people. And we always used to ask when we were kids, how come the German how come the German people let Hitler do all this? Because they had internalized enough of his values of persecution and racialism to tolerate mass murder. It wasn't just Hitler sitting in Berlin or in a Fuhrer bunker in some mountain. His armies were doing this to people. They went into Poland, they killed six million people. They went into Russia and as they moved toward Moscow, every village, they wiped them out. Most of, most of the victims in the war were unarmed. It was internalized in the people of that time. Not everybody, but enough. And enough people who even might not have felt comfortable about it did it because it was the thing they were told to do. So how do, how do people overcome that and gather the strength to live on values and not on authority? alone. Um, it's really about education. All the information that's being talked, I'm, I'm talking about, it's all readily available for people who want to know. You, you can read about a dozen countries where we've gone in and killed 100,000 people. There's a lot of them. But you won't read about it in the newspaper and it won't be in the textbooks. And so it becomes a, uh, it can become a journey. But when you hear, you might hear somebody talking about it in, at the United Nations or something like that, don't dismiss them. There may be truth in what they're saying. And ultimately, it's the ignorance of racism that allows all this to flourish. 
I had a professor once who said, what is race? Everybody thought they knew. Oh, it's skin color. Well, there's people in this part of the world that have the same skin color, but they're not part of that race. Well, it's about this feature or that feature. No, there's people here that have that feature, but they're not part of that race. And in the end, he said, race is socially defined by our perceptions and our lack of knowledge. We don't know. Karen? I'm wondering if you want to open it up for some That's a good idea. I think, you know, we only have a certain amount of time, and I know many of you had questions about um, Detroit during the Civil Rights Movement. What was it like here? Uh, perhaps even questions. I know you were uh, studying about our local context. You could ask some questions to your family. We watch videos of what happened in Pontiac. So what type of questions do people have? about civil rights movement in the Detroit metro area context, or I guess even abroad, because Mr. Ballon's pretty knowledgeable. So some of you even came from um, heritage countries that you weren't sure what the connections were. I would bet that Mr. Ballon might have some ideas on that as well. So questions from anybody? There are some books written on this that I can refer you to. But tell me what you want to know first. What do you want to know? Uh, you said when you were growing up, the elementary schools were not segregated, and the middle and high schools were segregated? No, the uh, uh, elementary school. were segregated by neighborhood. Okay. And then uh, the junior high and the high school, uh, Ecorse is a, was a small community, about 18,000 people. They couldn't build two high schools. <laughs> so it was fully integrated, both the staff and the students were integrated at the high school level. And you said that the administration or the city believed in segregation, though. The population did. The, pop the adult yes, population. Yes, the adult population. So what was it like having adults and children with different mindsets, and how, how did that maybe affect your households or your friends' households? You know, do you know what mm -hmm. your parents thought against what you thought or what your friends' mm -hmm. parents thought versus what they thought about segregation and different mm -hmm. races? Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's see, uh, an, an, uh, some, uh, and I'll use the term white because there's not really a good definition of white either, <laughs> but, but there's a social definition of all races, including white. Uh, the white residents were kind of split. Some were, came from a southern uh, background. They came from either Mississippi or Kentucky or something and they were raised in a racialist concept that you know but at the same time those same parents sent their kids to an integrated high school so th there was a dualism you know they they, they could but th if somebody tried to move in like on west side of detroit uh l later in life um it, it was all white in the 1970s still uh, on, on the west side, and a black family moved in. Um, this was 1978, I believe it was, moved in on, on a street. And that night, the house was vandalized and terrorized, and the family was driven out of the house. Uh, uh, the uh, windows were broken. The side, the side uh, siding of the house had spray painted messages for the family to get out. Um, and they terrorized the family. Uh, but there were all, there were whites in that community who hated that. And I was living in that neighborhood at that time. And so we organized and we tried to repair the house and invite the family to stay, but they said they couldn't stay in a circumstance like that. It was unsafe for their children. Um, the white population had a, it, 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 it was dualistic, but in e Ecorse, that small community, if a black family had tried to move in in the early 60s, the same thing would have happened to them. But they were okay with um, Latino. 
primarily uh, uh, Mexicans f who had spent a generation in Texas or in the South, and they had migrated up here during World War II because of the jobs, because, uh, and, and they accepted it. And there were, there was temporary housing built in that town at that time for all sorts of folks to migrate, whether they're from the white South or the Latino South, or from Mississippi, black Mississippi, they moved north of Outer Drive. White Mississippi, they moved south of Outer Drive. And they all accepted it because most, many of the folks were for only first or second generation. They didn't feel like they owned the community, so they couldn't change that. Um, <clears throat> and then there, there were, there became fights after I moved out of Yecourse in the 70s, early 70s. There, there were racial fights that took place. That's long ago. Um, and it's right now, it really isn't part of like a street issue anymore in, in, in our world. But it was back then. Now it operates at the political level of government in Lansing and in Washington. And they're determined, for political reasons, to go back to a pre-civil rights conditions in this country, step by step. Do it slow enough and people won't catch on. So, as you know, mm -hmm. across the country there is a student movement that is building. Yes. Very encouraging, yes. Any, any wisdom on ways to be effective? Yeah. Uh, when people come together for a common purpose, over time it's easy for people to, who came together to redivide over their differences. And so you always have to keep the mission and the purpose of your unity together, understanding there's going to be people who see other issues differently. Uh, I, I, I don't have any quick examples to offer, but um, but say, say say everyone comes together to to form a counterweight to stop the NRA. Well, some of them might support this political candidate, and some might support that candidate, but that's not a reason to fall out. You stay together for what you're together for, and discuss the differences that you have. And it's the process of discussion over time, respectful discussion, that people move forward on. Because, you know, when we we're f first, <clears throat> when, when our, when in our high school, when we were first against, against the Vietnam War, the first issue was we just don't want to be drafted. We don't want to go to war. Then as we talked about it more, we began to understand what it was and how deeply it was rooted and how this wasn't only happening in Vietnam, but it was happening in other places. And we became more willing to challenge the system that was creating this. But that came out of discussion and came out of learning. And, uh, you know, there's a lot that's been written about gun violence in the previous decades. And there's a lot, a lot of material to learn from. And it's just a question of going to grab it and take it. Anybody want to disagree with anything I said, I welcome it. You got to be open to discussion. And please, do it. You can do it. Do it now. We can have a discussion. You should have your voices heard, too. You're, the, you're a quiet bunch. Is it always this quiet? <laughs> <laughs> And what was it like? Oh, yeah. You talked a little bit about always having the mission in mind and <coughs> the single goal that you always want to work towards. But mm -hmm. do you have any experience actually being in it? Or, you know, yeah. Today? Yeah. When, uh, when I got out of the Army, and by the way, I read my first real bo book that really understood the Vietnam War from a uh, U.S. Army Special Forces Green Beret who wrote a book. His name was Donald Duncan, who wrote a book that just opened. They're incredible. I said, this guy, I mean, he's dedicated career. I read that book. When I got out, um, 
I started taking class at Henry Ford Community Colleges, and I organized an anti-war march, and I, I brought people in from outside the college, and as well as some teaching staff at the college, and we, we took over the high school or the college cafeteria, and we did education on what the Vietnam War was. Um, last year, when they organized to shut down those 38 schools across the state, uh, we, we had a, a big event at Charles Wright Museum. There were 300 people there on Super Bowl Sunday of 2017. They said, forget football, this is about, about children. 300 people came together and they asked me to organize a rally to fight the school closings. So I organized a rally. I invited the superintendent from East Point, Michigan, because one of his schools was being closed. But East Point, East, it's in East Point, the schools are still called East Detroit Public Schools. And one of his schools has a majority of African American students. And that was the one the state chose to close. So we brought people in and networked from Saginaw to, to Kalamazoo and everywhere. And we did a rally at uh, Rick, Rick Snyder's office on Grand Boulevard in Detroit. Printed up 200 signs. You know, open and improve, keep our schools open and improve and rebuild our schools. That's what the sign said. Real simple message. And event, Snyder backed off because we started networking across the state. I published it on an, one of the be biggest blogs on education in the United States. I published an article about what they were doing in, in Michigan, and it was reaching the education world across the country. We were, we were having an effect because we chose to stand up and speak out. But if none of us had done anything, those schools would have been history. It made a difference. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, uh, also did it through legal suits, did two, two, two lawsuits on emergency management, which is a fraud. The Michigan Constitution does not say that politicians can shut down your vote. It's not in the Constitution. The Constitution, the preamble of the Michigan Constitution says, the people are the supreme authority. Please. Um, you know the movie Detroit? I, I know it, but I didn't go see it. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you if it's like accurate. Some friends of mine who saw it, I, there was a lot of stuff on uh, social media of, of people who knew what happened in 1967. They said it, they just did not like the misrepresentations. So I chose to not go see it because I don't like to encourage it. But I think there's still some documentary work going on uh, about it, uh, about what really happened. Uh, un unfortunately, it, that should have been written <laughs> decades ago, <laughs> and the film should have been produced decades ago. But um, well, there's a good book on it. I can't who the author is. Uh, the is that Jamone who wrote that? Or? Who? Who? Is that Jamone who wrote the, the book on the Oh, hell. Well, there were several books written on it. Uh, John Hersey wrote one. There was a book written by, uh, in the early 70s called Detroit, I Do Mind Dying. And it was about, not just about what happened in 67, but it was about the, the conditions, the, com the social conditions that existed at the time and the, the strong fight back that was going on. There was, there was more activism in the early 70s than there were in the 90s or thereafter. And a lot of people were demanding a, di a, different, a different arrangement uh, to get rid of power. But again, what would you do if the governor issued an edict and said, I'm appointing a person to take over the city of Bloomfield Hills and a person to take over Bloomfield Hill District and your school board and your city council and your mayor are going to go sit in a corner and shut up. Those are the people you elected to run your sources. And the governor says, I'm going to take the, whatever the budget is of your school is and of your city. That's mine now. I control it. I'm going to give you an anecdote. <clears throat> 
And this is also going to be difficult to say, so I'm just, I'm going to force myself through this, okay? But an emergency manager was appointed by Rick Snyder over the Detroit Public Schools in May of 2011. His name was Roy Roberts. He was a General Motors executive. Never spent a day trying to teach or administer in a school, but he was going to run the school district. Totally unqualified. The first meeting he had, that was, there was a, an event organized by parents, and they always say, we want to know what the parents think. We want to hear what the community has to say. Well, the people who had that responsibility, you just iced them all, you know. But so they, do, they put on a show where they appear to be meeting with the community. And so special needs parents came together and organized the very first meeting, special needs being kids with, you know, uh, learning disability, they can't. <sighs> Detroit had some special needs schools that people from outside of Detroit and in Detroit used because the kids had such severe learning disabilities. And I mean very severe. Deaf, blind. Detroit had the only school for the uh, blind in the metro Detroit area. So people used it from all over. So those parents came together. And I consider special needs parents. And I, I, was, I would go to their schools and participate because they would ask, ask me to come and learn more about their situation and what they're going through in their schools. And I was just overwhelmed. It was amazing what those parents were doing and what the teaching staff was doing. And so they came together to the new person I'll call the dictator. He came, they came together. And the first parent stands up and says, for the last three years, my son was supposed to be in a program. He had moderate special needs. He was supposed to be in a program to learn how to be a short order cook. So he, he, even with his disabilities, he could get a job. But they set he and his whole school in a cafeteria and there was no instruction for anything for three years. They sat in a, care, in a cafeteria and talked to each other for three years. What will you do about that? Now this is what emergency management is. He said, I am not your elected school board and I do not want to hear about your problems. He said, if you think you have something to say, take it to your school board. The school board had no authority. They abolished the power of the school board. So this woman, not to be deterred, very strong, very knowledgeable about the law on special needs at the federal and the state level, she stood up, pulled out her business card. He said, stop right there. He says, I don't want your business card. And if you think you have anything to say to me, you can stand in a line behind 4,000 other people. I don't want to hear what you have to say. That was the first day of emergency management in the public realm. That's what the reality was in Detroit public schools. And they used that to systematically shut the system down and put kids on the street. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.